Okay, hello everybody and welcome to my talk on autonomous agent. My name is Daniek or I go by uh, the nickname Z and I'm an API expert uh, working in the field of AI and APIs. I started my API journey uh, quite a long time ago, 15 years ago with a project called Apiary, which was one of the first API design platforms where we pioneered this uh, approach to APIs about API first, design your APIs. Now, Oracle uh, acquired APR many years ago, and that's when I, well, that's when I started uh, as an independent API consultant, working together with my partners with the largest enterprises that we have on this planet. And we work on the executing and defining their API strategy. Now, over the years, the problems with APIs are repeating and they are same. Regardless whether you are in the banking or logistic company or fashion or automotive, Whatever it is, so that's why I started the. Uh, uh, that, that's why I started the uh, uh, Superface, and Superface is a company that try to uh, that aims to bring AI and APIs together, and we'll talk about it uh, a little bit today. Okay, so the important thing here is we all have been upgraded this year. This year was a massive year to us, and it was of course thanks to large language models and the rise of uh, APIs. Uh, AI. And we must ask ourselves, what is the what is the impact of uh, the recent development in the LLMs and uh, AI on APIs? And I would like to take this opportunity and explore it today with you. Okay, so first to understand what's going on, we need to look at how we build APIs today. And the APIs are really at, the, at its essence an interface for sharing capabilities, sharing capabilities with your teammates, uh, between the services, but also between the organizations. And as such, it has two aspects. One is the business, so the capability that you are sharing. What is this nature? Let's say a weather forecast for London, a data model of this weather forecast, and the fields in this data model. That's a business aspect of an API, but then there is a technical aspect of an API. So how somebody implemented delivering of that business capability. So on this uh, screen, you might see an HTTP protocol being used, a URL returning this JSON. So that's what we know, we call it a REST RESTful API. And that's business and a technical aspect of the same thing, delivering a capability, okay. Now, what we are doing over the years is we are tightly coupling our clients and server together. We are taking this technical information uh, from the server, so how it was implemented, and we are hard coding those informations into the client. So whereas client just needs to get the weather in London, it also has to have a knowledge of how it was implemented in a with the chosen API. And that information is welded into the client. And this is of course bringing a problems. So you cannot change the API without breaking the clients and the clients need to be aware of uh, the API changes. So versioning of the APIs is one of the many problems. There is a lot of problems and a lot of things that API providers have to think about, including how to publish, discover, secure, design, test, API, how to do product management properly. But at the end of the day, it all, all boils down in API documentation. And API documentation is the centerpiece of uh, how we make APIs and how we deliver and how we consume APIs today. Now, if you take it to the consumer side, so somebody who needs to uh, connect to an API, this is what we are always looking at, a typical integration project. And again, this might be a big corporation trying to integrate the partner's API, but this might be also your single developer connecting to, let's say, Stripe APIs. So it is fundamentally, every integration is fundamentally these four steps. Analysis, development, testing of the integration, and of course, deployment. And every single integration project I've seen to date always underestimated the analysis. The analysis always takes the longest, always is underestimated. The question is like, is this the right API? How much it costs? Does it have the capability that I need? How do I use it? How it works? How to get the access? How do I map their data model to my world, to my data model? So there are these questions and many more that we always struggle with and we always basically need to read through documentation and uh, test those APIs. And this is always underestimated at the cost of the other steps. Development still needs to happen. And then usually testing is the one that suffers. So that's uh, looking at this uh, API uh, problematic from the consumer's perspective. Now we put this all together. We all are essentially doing uh, API, what I call API plumbing. So manual labor on the provider side, somebody has to design an API, implement, test, 
document, publish, pub, build SDK, and many more steps, actually. So this is already a lot of people. So consumer working on their integration project can find that API, try it, figure out how to purchase it, figure out how to access it, uh, how to get the keys, implement the integration, test it, and maintain it forever. So this is a P API plumbing. And as you can see, at the end of the day, this is connecting two pieces of software, but there's a whole lot of people uh, that have to be involved. And again, these people are working and sharing this knowledge between the two parties uh, through API documentation. And true to be told, API documentation shares most of the information out of the band in a human-centric form. And this was not accessible until this year. So you can already see that we can use AI to leverage uh, its capabilities of uh, understanding or processing human-oriented documentation to reduce the API plumbing. Let's look at how it might look like. So we are after using an AI to uh, quicken, to, uh, to speed up API analysis, and eventually let AI connect the APIs for you. So you can, of course, go directly to uh, whatever large language model and the chat uh, client to it. You are using, let's say, JGPT, BART, or a Copilot, uh, if you are using GitHub. If it knows the API, and if it has the up-to-date information about the API you want to connect to, then usually these are relying on some sort of open API spec specification. And we learn over the time that the quality varies. Some open API specs are complete and thorough. Some of them have just examples with other schemas. So it's really hard to predict the results if the input quality differs. Now, the code quality of uh, integration generated by AI also differs based on your target language. And you are, at the end of the day, still tightly coupled, welded, uh, to that API. And finally, we think that chatbots are for users and not programmers. So if you are a programmer, you probably prefer manipulating with structured data and not talking to a um, virtual assistant. So all these taken together, that's why we've built a Comlink. Comlink is a communication link for APIs, and it's something we've been working on for over two years now. Comlink analyzes API documentation. It could be a plain text, it could be HTML, it could be also your open API specification. It figures out how to fulfill your use case with that given API. So what you want to do, the capability that you are requesting, and uh, creates the mapping for you. Then you can use the Comlink directly in your application to talk to that API. So this is not about the integration platform or anything. This is really leveraging the power of Comlink to figure out what you want from an API and then connect to that API directly. And when I say API documentation, I really mean API documentation. So to illustrate this, this is an actual command that you can use to index an API documentation for further AI processing. In my examples, I would be using recent, an email, amazing email uh, provider or a, a, a service that allows you to send emails. And so you can see that you can, in the first uh, line here, you can index the API, their API documentation directly as it is on their website, and then you stay your use case, in our case, sending an email, uh, and this will generate you a Comlink interface, which describes that business nature I was talking about, the business nature of what you want to do with an API. And you can then get mapping and get uh, that API to figure out how to fulfill that uh, Comlink interface with a recent API and call it directly from your application. Important thing here is that this is about you, the consumer, the client, and about your vocabulary. So it can help you map your vocabulary into whatever the API, whatever the provider of an API decided to call it. So let's say you don't like the from field uh, in this use case example, and you would rather have it called sender. That's no problem. You can just you know change that interface and say, hey, AI, do this mapping. AI is really good at inferring uh, semantics. So it will figure out that it should map the sender field to whatever that API is calling it. Important thing here is 
to understand that this dramatically reduces the time for you to need an API to integrate an API because you don't have to spend too much time analyzing API documentation. In many cases, we've seen people not even having to look at API documentation. So you just so you just digest the documentation, say what you want, and get your com link so your application can get integrated. So this decouples you from that API, including the API data model, including the API style media attempts, etc. In our work examples, you've seen that you were not exposed to the technicalities of how recent decided to implement uh, their email sending capability. And most importantly, it also helps you with the changes. So if the recent decided to change API from V1 to V2, let's say from one API code to be three API codes needed to fulfill sent email, then the AI will just update the mapping and it will still work uh, and your client will be uninterrupted. For what it matters, they can move from REST to GraphQL, as long as they deliver the business capability of sending email, then you are good and your uh, application is working. Finally, what I want to illustrate here with this approach, you have this interface for sending emails defined, but you can ask uh, Comlink, Comlink Engine, to basically map the same interface to multiple APIs. So in our case, uh, we already went through recent, we can also point at, uh, let's say, SendGrid and say, okay, map this, for send email use case to resend, which we've seen, and map it to send grid. This way you get the same interface, uh, but the two different API providers. So you can ask Comlink to figure out how do I do this with that API? And this gives you the power of unifying or harmonizing APIs, harmonizing the data models, and uh, using same fixed interface to possibly uh, multiple API providers. Now we can take this to the other side. We can take this to a provider here. And the same engine can be used with providers in uh, improving their developer experience, their APIs developer experience. So example I'll illustrate this on is Sonos. So in Sonos, it's a very great uh, product. It is a little bit complicated API. If they would put this input field there where the users, the clients, somebody who wants to integrate with Sonos speakers can just stay there uh, requirement, let's say, play music on the speaker in the kitchen, right? And this would give you these comlinks that you can use them directly uh, from your application without the need to figuring out how Sonos implemented their API today, how many different API calls you need to take in order uh, to get this music played on your speakers. Okay, so, so far, we see that we can now integrate many APIs really quick. We don't have to bother with API documentation and we can have a client that is resilient to API changes. We don't even have to know what endpoints from that API we are using, what API styles, is it using JSON or is it using XML? So now the question is, if we don't have to know the endpoints, do we even have to know the API that we use? And the answer is of course, no. Enter the autonomous agent. So in a concept, Autonomous agent is a software that acts on behalf of a user and is free to make decisions. There is a concept of agent that includes tools, memory, planning, actions. For us, the most important part here in this talk is the tools, which is the capabilities, the external capabilities you are giving to agent uh, to, to do its task, to fulfill its task, right? And for us, the tools would be, uh, of course, APIs and the capabilities delivered through APIs. So how does agent works? So first and foremost, it has no hard coded API calls. So no more welding. It doesn't know anything about that API you are about to use. It decides at runtime what API to connect to, and it figures out at runtime how to connect to that API. So this is how it works. There is an API, there has to be a known registry in where the client navigates and client, oh, sorry, the API uh, declares to the register. I'm here, this is the capability, this is the business capability that I'm offering, and this is how clients can connect to me, okay? An agent goes to the registry, I'll, stay, I'll stick with my uh, sending email example and asks, what APIs are available, okay, for sending email? The register replies, okay, here are the available providers for what you need, and this is how you connect. Then it's up to the agent to decide uh, how it connects to those APIs, which one it will pick, and then communicate directly with uh, the chosen API. So that's in a nutshell. Important thing here is 
that the agent navigates within a landscape. So this might be your organizational landscape and it's, pro, uh, it's programmed for use cases. So again, that business nature of the things, what you want to do, not APIs. It doesn't have hard-coded APIs information. It doesn't know where the services are. It's programmed for what you want to do for business uh, nature of the thing. So your agent is given a, a realm, a landscape in, within its navigation. It might be your organizations, you might have two inventory services, uh, CRMs, order systems, whatever it is. Now, of course, there are multiple landscapes. So there is your organizational one. There are the capabilities available to your agent uh, within your organization. But then there is, of course, a global landscape with many more, possibly infinite uh, number of capabilities. And your agent can pull in the capabilities or your registry in your organization can be configured to pull in the capabilities from the outside world. So, for example, Sending a text message, it's something you probably the capability to send a text message. Something you probably don't have in your in, uh, internal landscape. But uh, your registry administrator can pull in, okay, in our organization, we are using Twilio for sending uh, SMS, okay? And tomorrow they can change it to, let's say, Infobit. That, that would be the example of it. So it's not just a global landscape. There are, of course, partners that you might have. So you might be pulling... Uh, into your landscape uh, capabilities of your partners. So you might be checking, let's say, inventory services of your partners. And this agent then can navigate in your landscape and also in the landscapes that uh, are made available to it. Okay, so let's illustrate it on a couple of examples. So first and foremost, let's look at a landscape that you don't know, that you don't understand and or is changing. So our user asks the agent or gives the task to the agent, figure out the inventory of this and that product of ours. The agent then taps on the Superface app or registry. Hey, tell me about the inventory. What are the, what are the services that has some inventory information? Okay. And as we discussed, uh, the registry will reply back, here are the available inventory services. And here, because the user is asking about the inventory for the product without any further specification, it will probably ask all the internal inventory services to figure out the inventory information and report back to user, hey, inventory for your uh, product is this and that. So this is really nice for navigating in landscapes where you don't know how many inventory services you have or where they are or who built them and you don't need to know it and or they might be added tomorrow. So a big changing landscape, or let's say you pull in inventory services from partners and whatnot. So that's where the agent really shines. Another use case, showcase for agent would be your personal assistant. It is configured for you. So based on your identity, based on the configuration, maybe even your organization, you can ask questions like, okay, when was the last email from Edgar? And the agent is configured uh, to understand that you are using Gmail. So it taps uh, on a Gmail API and reports back, hey, this is when was the last email from Edgar. Final example I want to show here is uh, that the agent is able uh, to pick the right capability and the provider for the task that you are asking uh, it to fulfill. So let's say you are asking to send a message from, uh, from you to uh, this Croatian number. And the agent, based on the configuration, prices, the quality, but also your query, because you are asking uh, about sending a text message to Croatia, picks the right provider for it, which would be an infobip in our illustrational example. So this is, again, agent deciding at the runtime what API from the available ones to choose based on your query, based on the constraints, based on maybe on the price and the quality, and decides to use the InfoBib and fulfills your, um, fulfills your request. Now, one final point I want to make is that these agents are very capable of actually figuring out uh, workflows. So multi-step complex workflow in unknown changing landscapes, putting all these things together um, let me illustrate this on an actual uh, showcase of a Superface Odermos agent. Now, you can ask this agent, hey, give me these, you know, uh, 10 users, last name, first name, their email from our CRM. 
mask out the the middle characters of their emails and put it in my spreadsheet okay and note there is a there is a typo here but this actually works and you are also not specifying what CRM so are you in Salesforce HubSpot PyDrive anything else or all of them maybe it in your landscape based on the configuration taps on all of these CRMs carries out the transformation masking out the emails and based on your identity, it knows where is your spreadsheet, so it puts uh, the result in your spreadsheet. So this is illustration example of uh, the power that these agents are giving us. So shall we forget about APIs? Well, there will be more APIs than ever. There will be the fundamental fiber under every agent's work. So if you are a provider, you still will need to provide an API. But if you are a consumer, if you are integrating an API, you might be also already starting to think about, okay, I don't need to know about these APIs and don't need to know about these endpoints and start employing agents that might help you in your work uh, and connecting to APIs without you worrying about how to connect and where to find them. So thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. If you would like to follow up with me on this topic, please find me on Twitter X at uh, ZDNE or just drop me an email at z at superface.ai and I will be happy to chat. Thank you.